think there's so much to be excited about in technology today. I mean, fundamental things about tech have totally changed in the last two decades. I mean, say you were to buy the biggest hard drive you could possibly buy just a few years ago, and you were to fill it up completely with movies. You could fit about 180 movies on that hard drive. If you were to do the same thing, just a number of years later, you could fit about 1,500 movies on the largest hard drive you could buy. Enough to watch movies all day, every day, for 125 days straight. Not only can we store more of the stuff we love, but we can also access more of the stuff we love more quickly. Cellular networks have been getting faster and faster. And things that used to be a burden, things that used to hassle us on a daily basis, like boot times to start up our computer, are no longer an issue. And culturally, we're embracing a lot of this technology Faster than, faster than we ever have been before. More and more people have been getting online. But along the way, a terrible trend has been emerging in the way we build technology. I work in tech, so I'm partly to blame for this trend. And a lot of you probably work in tech too, so you might be to blame as well. But I think if you listen closely today, you can hear how we can move past this awful trend and build a better tomorrow. I'm a user experience designer. To me, that means I do everything I can to understand your common everyday problems and then use technology to solve them. Right now, I do that at Zappos Labs, where we look at the future of the company and we look at new products and services to solve the everyday problems for our customers and people that could be our customers. Before, I did it at Samsung Labs, where we looked at everyday problems for people and created new gadgets and services around those problems. Before that, I worked at Cooper's, the design consultancy, worked with startups, the Fortune 50 companies, and we look at everyday problems for their customers and try to solve them. I think it's my job as a designer to solve people's problems. But I think as an industry, we're writing a way that takes us away from solving people's problems meaningfully. What's so crazy about this trend is that it started from something so good. About 40 years ago, we could build smaller components. Then it meant we could build smaller computers. And they went from room size to desktop, and we brought them into the workplace. But we gave people this awful user experience. We forced them to use the language written by programmers for programmers. Things like dir, just to get their everyday job done. But then we gave them this. Xerox ideas of a window, an icon, a menu, and a pointer, we got our first mainstream graphical user interface. It was great. All of a sudden, we could point and click, drag and drop. What we saw is what we got. And about 10 years later, we could start touching those interfaces. It was even better. But today, our love for the digital interface has gotten completely out of control. It's become the innovator's answer to everything. This is one of the first patent drawings for a car. The technologists at the time solved an everyday problem that people had around transportation. But when we look at the car today, and we wonder, how can we make it better? We slap an interface on it, a screen in the middle of your speedometer so you can check your Facebook and your Twitter instead of how fast you're driving. This is one of the early patent drawings for a refrigerator. Technologists at the time solved an everyday problem around food storage, food supply that people had. But when we think about how can we make a refrigerator better today, a lot of top-end appliance companies just slap an interface on it. So you can update your Evernote when you go get ice. <laughs> Take a simpler thing, a hair dryer. How do we make a better hair dryer today? We slap an interface on it. <laughs> Instead of physical buttons, that are low, medium, and high. We have color LCD touch screens, so you can slide your finger across the screen. How do you make a better vending machine? <laughs> Instead of clear glass, slap an interface on it. These are high-end vending machines being distributed all across the country where you can tap on your Oreo cookies and watch them spin around in virtual 3D. <laughs> How do you make a better guitar? Slap an interface on it. Who needs strings in the 21st century? 
How do you make about a trash can? You slap an interface on it. This is one of $47,000 recycle bins in London, England. So you can see that it's raining outside when you're standing outside. <laughs> How do you make a better Wi-Fi hotspot? Slap an interface on it. This is AT&T's new hotspot, so you can go through app-like menus so you can change your password. How do you make a better drinking straw? Slap an interface on it. <laughs> How do you make a better microwave? You slap an interface on it. How do you make a better soda fountain machine? Well, instead of pushing your cup against these analog controls, Coca-Cola has been working with Wendy's to create these digital confusing circular menus so you can choose what kind of Coca-Cola you want to drink. <laughs> How do you make a better oven? Slap an interface on it. This is a seven inch Android powered touchscreen, the latest and greatest ovens, so you can watch YouTube while you bake cookies. How do you make a better infant seat? Slap an interface on it. There's no better way to get your kid to stop crying than to shove a huge iPad in front of their face. And lastly, how do you make a better toilet? Slap an interface on it. This is the iPotty, which debuted at CES and is now available at Target. What happened? <laughs> Where did we go wrong? Well, somewhere along the way, I think we got confused. We started thinking UX was the same thing as U UI. User experience was the same thing as user interfaces. And we started solving problems with screens. You know, UX is about people. It's about empathy. It's about our emotions. It's about our typical processes. UI is about the machine. It's about drop-downs and form fields. And you know, maybe this isn't even our fault. If you look at a lot of job listings, a lot of people were hired as sort of UX slash UI designers. It's your job to build more interfaces. It's made our lives surrounded by screens. Your desk isn't decent if you don't have at least two monitors. Your, smart, your smartphone isn't good unless it's the size of a piece of toast. We have millions of mobile apps. Our greatest minds aren't working on taking us to space. They're working on ads for all these interfaces. And this is a story that happened about one year ago today. In San Francisco, everyone is kind of looking down at their screens. When everyone's trying to solve your problems on a screen, you can't help but look at these addicting things. A gunman walked onto a muni train, rubbed his nose with a gun, waved it around in the air. Nobody noticed until he shot and killed another passenger. This is crazy, right? I mean, there was times when I looked at books and magazines on a train, but we're so inundated with the phones and tablets in front of us. Even active users, Kleiner Perkins has found, get about 150 notifications a day. So if you try to hide your phone, it's buzzing and beeping, begging to come out of your pocket. You know, there was a time not long ago when our lives were filled with paper, and we dreamed of a paperless world. Now, instead, our lives are filled with screens. And I think we should dream of a screenless world. I actually think that the best interface is no interface at all. And I'll just show you how we can get there. So I've created a set of principles, three principles. They're not about things, but they're about us, because it's us that we should be designing for. The first principle is to embrace typical processes instead of screens. A number of car man manufacturers have recently been re releasing apps. Tesla, BMW, Ford. One of the features they advertise is that it can unlock your car doors. That it's an improvement on the car key. Well, let's just see how that works. I'm walking up to my car, and I want to unlock my car doors. So I pull out my phone. I want to unlock my car doors, so I wake up my phone. I want to unlock my car doors, so I slide to unlock. I want to unlock my car doors, so I enter my PIN code. I want to unlock my car doors, so I hit the home button to exit my last opened app. I want to unlock my car doors, so I hit the home button to exit my last open group. I want to unlock my car doors, so now I swipe through a sea of icons trying to find that app. 
I want to unlock my car doors and I finally find the app and I go ahead and I tap on the app. I want to unlock my car doors so I wait for the app to launch. Whoop. <clears throat> See this beautiful map of North America. <laughs> and I want to unlock my car doors and there's no real clear way to do it here but if you look in the center option it says control and maybe that'll help me unlock my car doors. So I tap control. And I want to unlock my car doors and one of the options here in this list says locking slash unlocking. And my car doors are locked so if I press this hopefully my doors will unlock. But instead I get this slider. And I want to unlock my car doors and even though it knows my doors are locked, I swipe the slider to the right. The system then tells me that, um, let's see here, it's loading, it's not quick. Oh, I have to go on forward one more slide. The system tells me that data transfer is successful and I guess that means I can unlock my car doors. Right? This, what happened there? Is this an improvement in the car key? I don't think so, right? I mean, there was me, there were all the steps I had to do with the digital interface, and sure, if I had a slightly different OS, or maybe if I got a new phone, I could use Touch ID and maybe get rid of one step there, but generally a lot of steps with the digital interface. And then there's my goal, right? The thing I really wanted to be doing. Let's say we were to follow this first principle, and we were to embrace typical processes instead of screens. Well, it looks something like this. Kind of crazy, right? Just two steps. You know, but before we got caught up in all this screen-based thinking, Siemens Systems worked with Mercedes-Benz on something that did exactly this. See, when you walk up to your car doors, they thought about your typical process. You pull the car door handle. And when you do, it sends out a low-frequency radio signal, and if your keys are in your pocket or your purse, the door is open. When I show you the video now, it doesn't even look like there's any technology going on because it's kind of seamlessly there. It's just part of the experience. Now some people look at this and say, well, you know, the app is great when I lock my keys in the car. Because then I don't have my keys in my pocket or my purse and I can unlock my car doors with the app. But because the system already, already knows where your keys are, you can't actually even lock your keys in the car. The whole automotive industry is filled with screen-based thinking. This is another app, it's called Viper Smart Start. It won an award at CES. It's not pretty, but from a user experience standpoint, it seems like it's a little bit better, right? It's got five really big common actions. But I would say that we think this is decent because we're used to looking at wireframes. I would say that we think this is okay because we're used to screen-based thinking. Let's take one of these actions, opening your trunk, bottom left there. And instead of screens, let's start with insights. This is what someone looks like when they're carrying something to the trunk of their car. This particular person happens to be Mitt Romney, but let's just say he represents the everyday man like he always wanted to. <laughs> Mitt probably isn't going to walk to the trunk of his car, want to put down the heavy cooler, pull out his phone, and go through all those steps. But Ford design team realized that even though his hands are full, his feet are free. So what they did is they put a sensor underneath the bottom of the trunk and it looks for a shin and a foot kick, and the trunk opens. Instead of an app, they made something that works within the typical process. You know, good experience design isn't good screens. It's good experiences. We've been fortunate to have been talking about this best interfaces, no interface idea around the world. And when I was in Sydney, Australia, I walked out of, the, walked out of my gate and I saw this huge ad from Nissan. It says, what if your car, you're sorry, what if your phone could make your car cooler? And it had this picture of an app where one of the tabs says climate and you can tap that button there that says turn climate control on. And when you press it, the car takes about 15 minutes to cool off. But let's kind of look at what it's actually like. And let's avoid interfaces and sort of embrace our typical processes here. This is what your car looks like on a hot day. It's sitting in a parking lot, 
You now, if it sits in the direct sun for about two hours, the interior of your car can heat up to about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty hot, right? This is what you might be doing while your car is sitting in a parking lot, watching a movie. With 15 minutes left in the movie, you probably aren't going to want to pull out your phone, go through all those steps, and press climate control on. The team at Toyota took a different approach. They borrowed some research that was going on at Mazda in the early 90s. And what they did is they put a very simple sensor inside the car, a thermometer. And when it goes over 86 degrees in the interior of the car, the sunroof opens just slightly, and little fans blow out the hot air outside, outside of the car. So the temperature of the car reaches near ambient temperatures. And the beautiful thing about the entire process is that if they think about the environment, right? Your car is sitting there in the heat, in the direct sunlight. So what they did is they powered the whole thing with solar power. You know your car is sitting in the sun when it's getting really hot. Might as well use that to advantage. Take a problem and make it part of the solution. Pretty awesome. The second principle is to leverage computers instead of serving them. Computers are incredibly powerful things. I mean, they can beat our greatest chess champions. They can beat our greatest Jeopardy players. But when we make them, we have this sort of bizarre relationship with them. We make them so they're kind of like three-year-olds. And they say weird things to us back. They say things like this. This is a real error message from Microsoft. <laughs> it happened because of this bizarre relationship that we create with computers. See, we for some reason make computers so that we serve computers. We have to search complex databases for simple information. We have to memorize countless passwords. We have to remember the name of our childhood best friend's dog. I say, let's reverse this relationship. Let's have computers serve us. Not long after I first started thinking and talking about this idea, a doctor reached out to me about a headlamp that does just this for him. See, this doctor is an emergency room physician. And what he does is he volunteers to do cave search and rescue. And he emailed me about this headlamp, right? And it helps him do this. Cave search and rescue is crazy, right? It requires crawling into small crevices, pulling out panicked survivors. It's by no, easy, by no means an easy task. And he emailed me about this headlamp. It's made by Petzl. It's a company that's been making headlamps for about 40 years, and they have their roots in caving. And they didn't just, you know, slap an interface on it for innovation. What they did is they tried to solve a problem. See, when the doctor looks in the deep, dark caves, a high, a high, bright beam is necessary. But that same high, bright beam washes out maps up close. So what Petzl did is they put a microchip and a light sensor in their headlamp. And when you look far away, the light brightens. And when you look close, the light dims. So instead of whitewashing his map, the light is constantly adjusting. It doesn't just make the, the just, just doesn't remove an annoyance. It makes the doctor better at his job. Computers should do things we don't want to do or that we don't even know we should do. When running for president in 2008, Barack Obama gave a speech about how if we better inflated our car tires, we could reduce our dependency on foreign oil. The opposing party kind of mocked it and sent out these tire pressure gauges with Obama's energy plan printed on them. But it turns out on this particular issue, he was correct. If we better inflate our car tires, we can save gas. In fact, we're probably safer on the road with better inflated car tires. So what is a, you know, what, what's going on there? Why, why, doesn't, why doesn't it happen? Why don't more people have their car tires properly inflated? Well, it's not an information problem. And you know, here, things in Oregon are a little bit different than the gas station. But for most of North America, pumping your tires with air is not such a fun experience. You first walk up to one of these machines and you pump your quarters to buy air, which is kind of a bizarre experience. And then you're kind of leaned over, showing the world something you don't really want to be showing them. 
So what does a major tire manufacturer do about this problem? Well, Goodyear has an app, and it lets you do things like print and email brochures. <laughs> but fortunately, Goodyear's Innovation Center in Ohio has been making these self-inflating tires. While you're driving, a little gauge inside checks to see if the tire pressure is correct, and if it's not, a little lever opens and it fills the tire with the right amount of air pressure. The tires are currently used in, in trucks delivering goods across the United States, and they're doing some testing to see if they can bring it to the consumer market. The third principle is to create a system that adapts for individuals. Everyone in here is unique. You're all special in your own way. You have your own favorite color, your own favorite way of getting things done. But that's not how we build software. We build software based on averages. And it takes a really smart team of people to solve some problems for some of those people some of the, some of the time. There's a different field, a field we sometimes work with, data science, which looks at individual patterns. And interfaces in data science have crossover. Right, there's LinkedIn recommendations about people you might know or jobs you might be interested in. But when you leave these interfaces behind and embrace data science, we can do so much more. This is Nest, and a lot of people are familiar with Nest. And when I first saw it, I thought they just slapped an interface on it. But what's interesting about Nest is that it learns about your regular patterns, knows when you sleep, when you're awake, what kind of, what kind of temperatures you like over the course of the day. And eventually, you don't need to interact with Nest at all. Eventually, it becomes a no interface solution. But there's a lot more we can do than just think about a small subset of temperatures we prefer. In fact, interfaces force us to be reactive, while a world of no UI can be proactive. This is a sensor called Early Sense. It slips under hospital beds. And instead of sort of all the thinking and machine ways of hooking up different cables and cords to you. Early Sense reads your vitals through a hospital mattress. It lets you kind of lie in the bed how you normally want to lie in the bed with all these cords on you. Pretty awesome. This is what a generic hospital machine looks like. It looks for generic input and then has sort of generic ranges and generic alarms that kind of go off. So if your heart rate is very high, It'll blast an alarm out into the, into the healthcare space. And hopefully, somebody will kind of pick up on it. But a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors, a lot of healthcare workers kind of miss these alarms. They go off for low battery. They go off when it looks like something might be wrong. It's a lot of guesswork going on. This, kind of, this problem is called alarm fatigue. A Boston Globe study from 2005 to 2010 found that over 200 people died in a particular hospital because there was so much alarm fatigue. Sitting in a hospital, that people weren't able to get the care they needed because the machines were letting them down. So what Early Sense does is it studies your individual patterns, your uniqueness. And when something is off about your patterns, not a generic pattern, but your patterns, Early Sense sends an alert to the particular healthcare provider that can help you about that particular problem. It thinks about individuals. And because it knows you so well, it can predict things hours ahead of time. We're all different. And a world of no UI can start to embrace that reality. So after I published this, first published this piece, Got a little bit of buzz. People like Tim O'Reilly and Edward Tufte started tweeting about it. The Verge wrote a piece about this. BBC wrote a piece about no interface. At Google's I.O. conference, they said that the future of search is no interface. Other people didn't like what I had to say. This is from the former creative, creative director of Berg who said no to no UI. Another guy named Scott Birkin looked at the no to no UI piece in my piece and was like, who cares? <laughs> But along the way, there's been a lot of interesting discourse, right? People have said some really fascinating things. One of the things people get really afraid of when I talk about this kind of stuff is automatic solutions. And you know what? People should be afraid of automatic solutions. They're really hard to get right. But when you get them right, they become an embedded part of our lives. For example, automatically deploying airbags are an awesome safety mechanism. 
automatic sliding doors. <laughs> we don't even think about them, right? They're just part of our everyday life. One of the craziest automatic solutions is automatic transmission. I mean, one of the dangerous places, most dangerous places we are on an everyday basis is in our cars, driving on the freeway. I mean, can you imagine pitching an automatic solution in a really dangerous environment? It's kind of crazy. Right, I mean, car lovers, they hate these things. They call them slush boxes. But when automatic solutions work well, people love them. More than 91% of all cars sold starting in 2009 are automatic transmission. What about failure? When you think about these kind of crazy magical systems doing all these things around you, what happens when they fail? Well, I think any good system considers failure. Automatic doors, for example, you can often push to open if they fail. One thing people are doing when they think about these things is they're moving user interfaces to be a secondary experience. They're letting no UI trump and, and UI be a secondary. For example, Petzl, the headlamp that I showed earlier, which has that sort of automatically adjusting beam, comes with a piece of software where you can adjust the level of the beam. Of course, Nest, which I showed, always has a UI available to you, and you can always reteach it or, or re have it relearn certain things. Early Sense, being complex medical software, has tons of data that doctors and nurses can go through to sort of tweak and make sure that the system is alerting the right people at the right time. Some people ask me, can you make an app with no interface? Well, you know, being at the Delight conference, thinking about Delight and how we kind of do it at Zappos, we, everything we make, we kind of try to add a little flavor to. For example, when you think about the Zappos mobile app, you shake it and cats kind of rain down from the ceiling. Kind of fun, right? But how do you create this kind of delight in, no, in a no-interface environment? Well, when the Moves app launched a few years ago, this was their original app icon. And then if you don't, for those not familiar with Moves, it kind of tracks your steps, your cycling, your running. And this is their original app icon, and when I saw it, I loved it. What they did was they changed the paradigm. They said, our app should be in your pocket, not in front of your face. And there's something incredible about this sort of back pocket app design that I think is an awesome design constraint for creating these sort of no interface solutions. For example, there's a company called Lockatron. They try to do house and apartment door locks better. And what they did is they asked people in their first round in their first sort of version generation of their product to remove their deadbolt, put a Lockatron deadbolt in, you walk up to your door, you have to go open an app, do all those things, then hit, hit one of these gigantic lock or unlock buttons. But in their second generation product, which they showcased on Kickstarter, what they did is they had a little cover that goes on top of your, your deadbolt and had a Bluetooth signature between your phone and your deadbolt. So when you walked up to your phone, I'm sorry, when you walked up to your deadbolt. The deadbolt itself just unlocked because of the signature that exists between your phone and the deadbolt. Your phone stays in your pocket, and that's the moment of magic. They raised $2.2 .2 million on a deadbolt, on a, on a keyless entry to your apartment. Kind of a non kind of a non sort of big deal issue, right? We're all kind of comfortable with it, but there's something really exciting about this kind of phone in your pocket solution. When Square was playing around with their wallet app, they had this setting buried in there called AutoPay. And when you turned it on, the idea was you could keep your phone in your pocket. See, when you reached a cafe or a restaurant where you're about to eat, your name popped up and your picture popped up on the register. And when you ordered, you didn't have to pull your phone out of your pocket and do some kind of tap magic or pull your credit card out of your pocket. Instead, your, your name was already there, so you could just pay by voice. You could just say, hey, I'm Vince. That's my sandwich. You know, David Pogue called it one of the most magical things he's seen. What about the web? Can you create a website with no app? It's not easy. There are some examples out there. For example, TripIt kind of works as a back-end communication channel between your emails of, from airlines to your calendar. There's Pandora, which has a little bit of interface. You hit play and you just kind of hide it. 
There's Mint, which you don't necessarily have to log into their site to sort of get their personalized alerts. Not exactly no interface, but sort of scratching the surface of the sort of personalized patterns. What about privacy? When you talk about these sort of magical things, privacy is a really big deal. I think it's inherently part of the conversation. I could give a whole talk just on the privacy aspects of this, but I'd like to talk about just one thing. This is Cortana. This is Microsoft's sort of voice system, right? When people talk about it, they compare it to Google Now or, or Siri. But one of the things I like about it actually is its settings menu. It uses this really straightforward kind of language, right? Track flights or other things mentioned in your email. That's pretty straightforward. That's pretty human language. And when you think about all these systems learning about you and thinking about you, having a settings menu that's transparent is a really fundamental part of it. Sometimes people say, you know, this is really hard. <laughs> this is not an easy thing to pull off. How can we convince my boss or my client to create this sort of million dollar algorithm that's going to learn about you and have these automatic solutions? Well, you know, along the way when you build these kinds of things, one sort of awesome thing you can use is people. Instead of building a computer system that's really kind of complex and very expensive, you can kind of use people to sort of beta test this. At Zappos Labs, we're kind of experimenting with all sorts of things all the time. And someone had the idea that people want to take a picture of something and be able to identify where they, where they could purchase that particular product. So whatever they bought, whether we sold it at Zappos or not, we would tell them where they could buy that. So if I saw someone's shoes and I wanted them, I could take a picture and we would send them back where exactly they could purchase them. But instead of building a million dollar image recognition program, we just use people as a conduit. And when, if it gets popular enough, if enough people want to do it, then we start to invest the money. You kind of do this in a stair-step sort of way. So there's all sorts of questions around this, right? And like one of the biggest is, is how do you get this done? When I first started talking about the best interface is no interface, I quoted something Donald Norman said. He said, the real problem with the interface is that it is an interface. And so I invited Donald Norman up, and we kind of had this debate. He took the anti, and I took the pro, and we kind of had this fun debate. And we had this discussion with this group about the best interfaces, no interface. And at the end of the session, I handed everyone this worksheet. And this worksheet was about how. How do we get this done? Now in the worksheet, the first principle is to embrace typical processes instead of screens. So I put a bunch of observations. Right? The Mitt Romney on the, on the street. Second principle is to leverage computers instead of serving them. And knowing the incredible sensor network that we have out there. It's one way to have, for computers to serve us. And there's all sorts of little sensor kits you can get like Twine or Leap. So I put a bunch of sensor possibilities on the worksheet. The third principle is to adapt, adapt to individuals. And one way you can do that is by embracing data science. So there's a lot of awesome data science tools out there. There's a lot of great sort of publicly free data that you can use. And so I put a bunch of data tools on there. And I gave each group, group of people who had never met each other before, 10 minutes to come up with a no UI solution. Kind of crazy. One of the groups tried to tackle this problem. This is around senior citizen medication. And we've kind of seen people take different leaps in this field before. Target, for example, worked on creating more clear labels for their prescription medication. But it's still a huge problem that a lot of senior citizens just forget to take their medication. So what this group came up with is the idea that instead of having your phone buzz and beep, that the last part of your pill would give you this sort of smell of pine. So when you smell pine, it would be time to take another pill. Using your nose as a notification system. It was weird, it was kind of wacky, whatever, right? But it was a hell of a lot more interesting than the screen-based thinking, right? <clears throat> Another group tackled something around running. Now, I'm a runner, and one of the things about running is that one of the only pieces of equipment you have is your shoes. And when your shoes wear down, it's not always easy to tell, but the foam sort of at the bottom compresses, and it's not as supportive for your ankles or your knees. And so there's a lot of, a lot of screen-based thinking around this, right? There's a lot of sort of shoe tracking apps 
that every time you go for a run, you come back and you enter how far you ran. And then it kind of gives you an estimate on when that foam may be compressed. But what this group thought is maybe you could put a packet of dye inside the foam. And when the foam compresses, it turns red. The, packet, the dye explodes and the whole sole of the shoe turns red. So you know it's time to get a new pair of shoes. It avoids all those steps that the, all those shoe tracking apps have. Now some people looked at this and they said, okay, after that workshop, that was your best idea? What does this have to do with tech? Well, a couple months later, I started to get a bunch of emails in my inbox. Turned out that Apple submitted a patent for something that sits inside the sole of your shoe to detect whether your shoe has worn out or not. Nothing to do with tech? There's so much to talk about when you talk about this idea. It's totally fascinating. You can always tweet the hashtag KnowUI. Different people are kind of talking about that, talking about the conversation there along with me. You can always tweet at me, email me anytime. You can go to knowinterface.com where you can see this talk. You can see me just go like this over and over. <laughs> One of the things you can do while you're knowinterface.com is download this PDF packet. It's got the original essay that I wrote. It's got that worksheet that I talked about. It'll sign you up for an email newsletter. But one of the things I'm really excited to tell you guys that I haven't even said at the newsletter yet is I've been working on a book called The Best Interface is No Interface. And we're working on it for the past year. And you can now pre-order it on Amazon.com. It's really exciting. It's my first book I've ever written. We sent, I sent it to the publisher. It's supposed to be 200 pages. They loved so much about what we had. We're now making it 300 pages. It's huge. It's super exciting. If you like this lecture, this book is a lot better than this lecture. <laughs> That's all I've got. You know, there's so much to celebrate, but there's an awful trend dominating. And I think if you start thinking about these three principles, we can start figuring out how we can build a different tomorrow. Thanks.